Good afternoon, and welcome to the 18th Annual Immigration Law and Policy Conference. I'm Anna Gallagher, Executive Director of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network Clinic. Yesterday, in the Catholic community, we celebrated the World Day of Migrants and Refugees. It was an opportunity to reflect on the ways that man is failing to welcome a stranger, but also the hope that we can change and do better. In Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis said, let us dream then as a single human family, as fellow travelers sharing the same flesh, as children of the same earth, which is our common home, each of us bringing the richness of his or her beliefs and convictions, each of us with his or her own voice. For decades, U.S. policy has treated poor black and brown migrants and asylum seekers as if they were our voiceless, other, less than. They are not. We are of the same flesh. We are not better, more deserving, smarter, or holier than them. We are one human family. All people have a right to seek protection. We must make this a reality. And now I turn you to my colleague, Andrew Seely from the Migration Policy Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Andrew Seeley, President of the Migration Policy Institute, and we're delighted to see all of you virtually, although we hope that uh, for next year we might be able to do this in person again and have a chance to, to see each other face to face. Um, one of the things that makes this conference unique and important is that we work hard each year to ensure a div diversity of voices and viewpoints. And we invite leading thinkers, major stakeholders, and key policymakers involved with immigration policy so that you can hear a variety of ideas and so that you can engage directly with them. Dialogue is more essential than ever in these polarized times. And this conference offers a place where conversation can, incur can occur in direct and respectful ways. I wish you two afternoons of smart analysis and enriching discussions. And I thank my colleagues from MPI Clinic and Georgetown Law for putting this conference together. It is our 18th annual conference. And in particular, I wanna thank from our side, Michelle Middlestadt and Lisa Dixon, Doris Meisner and Moose Chisti, who have really carried the bulk of the work from the MPI side. Um, and with that, I have the great pleasure of turning it over to the Dean of Georgetown Law, Bill Trainer. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I'm uh, really especially pleased for Georgetown to host this annual conference for the 18th time which brings together experts from government, advocacy, the media, think tanks, and academia to address the most challenging immigration issues facing our country. So just pleased to welcome Georgetown students as well to the conference and colleagues who engage on these issues day in and day out. Uh, Georgetown Law's motto is laws but the means, justice is the end. And we take this motto very seriously. With respect to asylum seekers whose current situation you'll be discussing, our students and faculty engage in ensuring the proper implementation of the refugee laws by the United States government. In our asylum clinic, teams of students represent individuals and families from around the world in, immig in immigration removal proceedings before immigration judges. In recent years, our students have provided excellent legal assistance to asylum seekers from dozens of countries from Afghanistan to Cuba and Haiti, El Salvador and Guatemala, Liberia and Madagascar, Tajikistan and Ukraine, to name a few. Georgetown is deeply committed to this field. Georgetown Law is delighted once again to partner with the Catholic Legal Immigration Network Clinic and the Migrant Migration Policy Institute, MPI, to offer you a superb program on the major immigration issues of our day. Thanks to Georgetown's partners for organizing such a robust program. And I'm particularly grateful as well to Professor Andrew Schoenholz, who has worked closely for many years with our partners at MPI and clinic, and whose work as a scholar and an advocate is of the most profound significance. So in closing, I wish you a very successful conference, one where we all learn how best to address the most challenging immigration issues confronting our society. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Doris Meissner. I'm a senior fellow at the Migration Policy Institute. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this first session of the conference. It's our keynote session with Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. Before we start, a housekeeping matter, which is that if you have any technical problems, please email them to training at cliniclegal.org. Now, 
we will, uh, in running this session today, um, have a different kind of a keynote from typically what a keynote connotes. Uh, you know, this conference, the Law and Policy Conference, is one in which we really pride ourselves on providing a place for decision makers to outline their priorities, but also to be directly questioned by those who attend and those in the audience. So we're particularly pleased this year that Secretary Mayorkas suggested a format of entirely Q&A as compared with prepared remarks. And so we are going to go ahead with that kind of a format. We will have about 35 minutes, which we will divide between a conversation that Secretary Mayorkas and I will have, and the other half of the time will be given over to the audience and to questions that you write into the Q&A box. Um, Secretary Mayorkas has not taken, has not seen the questions, so this is a spontaneous a way of having interaction as we've been able to do at these conferences. And so I'm going to go ahead and start that off by making a couple of comments about the secretary before we jump in, um, because I want to set the scene really here uh, in terms of the times that we're in. I think it's fair to say that no one is more or has been more qualified for this position of Secretary of Department of Homeland Security than Secretary Mayorkas. He served as the director of USCIS, which is when he and I first met. He then became the deputy secretary of DHS, and now he is the secretary of DHS. So it's a very robust background, but I think it's fair to say that even with all of that preparation and all of that experience, I expect that it's been more than anybody would have expected. There have been strong headwinds from the very outset. The key appointees of the immigration components at DHS, two of the three are not even yet in place. And the drumbeat has been constant from the very beginning. You just look at the last several weeks um, to get some sense of what the pace has been. I mean, there's been a new sweeping asylum rule published. There have been several court decisions and lawsuits filed regarding enforcement, Title 42, MPP, a massive ongoing undertaking with the Afghan uh, uh, evacuation, the continuing record, of course, of historic numbers of encounters at the Southwest border, including the recent surge at Del Rio, this morning, the Department of Homeland Security published a DACA rule, which has, is an important development. And then there's everything beyond immigration, things like Ida, which swept over the southern part of the country and sundry other tasks. So although DHS is in the lead, um, there are, these are massively interagency activities, whole of government uh, efforts, strong responsibilities and interest by the White House, which all add to the complexity of this job. So Secretary Mayorkas, I think it's fair to say that your job has become one of the most visible and important in the Biden administration. There's been progress, you've all made progress on many fronts, but the public conversation has centered almost entirely on the Southwest border with the Haitians in Del Rio at the top of the news in recent weeks. So I think we need to start there. The Haitian arrivals, of course, are not new, but they spike dramatically from last year to this year and from what we're reading more en route. You've been in the media a lot recently on this, but still, let's begin by having you tell us what's going on here. What's the update on the numbers and the decisions in the processing of these cases? And how does the administration reconcile updating TPS for Haitians through July 29th and just weeks later, now less than two months, um, returning some of these migrants to Haiti? So Doris, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to join uh, everyone. You know, one thing, if I may, um, 
the conversation certainly is focused on the southern border. Uh, I think you are correct in that. But the question I have is the conversation um, amongst whom? Is it the political conversation or is it the conversation uh, of the American people? And I think that's a question to be posed because I would uh, most likely submit that um, those who were impacted by Hurricane Ida are focused on the work of FEMA and restoration and not necessarily uh, what is incurring in Del Rio, Texas. And that is not to minimize the gravity and urgency of the latter uh, situation. Let me, let me first um, speak of the TPS uh, decision, because I think that we, uh, those of us who have been in Homeland Security work for a number of years, and specifically in the immigration arena, understand that the assessment of con country conditions is a temporal matter. And so earlier in the year, of course, we looked at the conditions in Haiti and made a determination that in fact, uh, temporary protected status was warranted. And it was sometime between that assessment and the actual publication in the Federal Register notice uh, of the announcement, um, there was a, a lapse of time. And the lapse of time was occasioned by the tragic assassination of the then Haitian uh, leader. And we were uncertain whether, um, you know, really whether stability would uh, be regained, political stability would be regained such that we were in actually a position to publish a register notice for temporary protected status, or whether we would have to hold it in abeyance and determine how the country conditions would settle. And in fact, uh, the political order stabilized to a degree sufficient, uh, that sufficient such that we felt comfortable in issuing the register notice and identifying the later date actually at that time of July 29th. Subsequent to that, we had the tragic earthquake in Haiti, but that, um, that tragic earthquake in consequence um, uh, geographically speaking, was distinct and distinguishable from what occurred in January of 2010, having been at US Citizenship and Immigration Services at that time. And because of its geographical limit, we felt that, and we continue to feel that a redesignation is not warranted. And in fact, working with Haiti, we felt it um, possible to return people uh, to Haiti, and we've contributed funds to facilitate uh, their resettlement. Uh, USAID has contributed uh, $5.5 million. Certainly not a position uh, that has achieved unanimity uh, of opinion. Um, the fact of the matter is, and this is not specific to the Haitian um, uh, diaspora, but um, the world is still reeling uh, from and in, in the pandemic and the downturn of economies um, have um, caused people in greater numbers uh, to leave their, um, their homes. And it is interesting, the data, at least with respect to the Northern Triangle countries reflects the fact that uh, people will uh, endure um, a level of violence uh, if they have a job, if they have some economic opportunity to gain sustenance. And so much of the increase in numbers is in our view, a product of economic desperation, a desperation created by um, a hem pardon me, a hemispheric a downturn in um, financial well-being. And um, it is unclear uh, whether uh, that will diminish uh, in scope, but what we are doing at an increasing level 
is working regionally with our partners on a multilateral basis to address the phenomenon of irregular migration on a more regional basis rather than bilaterally or even unilaterally. Well, okay. And so that whole issue of the border and the circumstances at the border is so tied up with the pandemic as you've said on the domestic side, which leads us to Title 42 and the question of the longevity of Title 42. I wonder whether you could um, uh, talk about what would change at the border if Title 42 were lifted either by court order or ultimately by CDC as COVID recedes. Well, I, you know, our hope is that if in fact it is occasioned by reason of a CDC decision um, with the arc of COVID changing materially, that would mean a regaining of footing uh, uh, regionally and therefore hopefully a diminution in the numbers that are seeking to migrate irregularly because the level of desperation uh, would not compel them uh, to take that journey. That would be uh, my hope. Um, if it is by way of court order, then of course, we have our plans uh, very well in development uh, to address the potential consequences. And those plans are not only in terms of ensuring our border security on the Southern border, but also our plans uh, with our partners uh, to the South. You know, um, I have said this uh, repeatedly um, in, in, you know, since uh, the implementation of Title 42, and I continue uh, to articulate it, which is that Title 42 is a public health authority. It is not a, an immigration policy, and it is certainly not an immigration policy that we would embrace. The question really, you know, when we take a look at it operationally, um, here is what, uh, Doris, we are, um, and everyone, we are confronted with. We are confronted with a, a, a population of people that, um, uh, as a general matter, um, have a, uh, a, a rate of illness of approximately 20%. And um, they arrive in between the ports of entry and must be placed in congregant settings, which um, as I think we all understand, uh, precipitate or could precipitate a significant spread of the disease. And what, when one is speaking of 7,000 or 7,500 people on average every day being encountered at the border. If one takes a look at that, um, the system is not built for that in a COVID environment where isolation is required if um, one is going to follow uh, the medical uh, protocols. And so it really uh, creates a situation where from a public health perspective, the CDC's decision is quite understandable. Okay, I'm going to take us to the broader immigration goals uh, that this administration uh, has articulated. Some have argued, and there's certainly uh, in, the, in the actions that have been taken uh, a reason to argue that the administration is loosening enforcement uh, in the interior of the country and um, tightening it at the border. So um, in terms of the, uh, the goals that this administration has come in with and the, the sense that that is what's happening, um, have the immigration goals of the administration changed uh, given the events of the last eight months? Um, what have been some of the things that you've encountered that you didn't expect as well as things that you did expect? And, um, what does a humane immigration system look like to you today? What's the administration's strategy for getting there? 
So I don't, um, I would uh, respectfully disagree with the framing that it's loosening in the interior and tightening uh, at, at the border because uh, I think that mixes, um, once again, the public health policy or, or rule with the immigration policy because really what is um, uh, galvanizing uh, um, uh, the indignation of many from um, the point of view of asylum and, and uh, law and, and uh, humanitarian relief is in fact um, the uh, continued implementation of Title 42. That should not suggest uh, a change in policy on behalf of the administration with respect to immigration policy and humanitarian relief. So I think that's um, uh, uh, frankly uh, a mixing uh, two very different things. I think what we, um, well, to say, you know, loosening uh, enforcement, I don't know that that is the framing that I would use. What I would, um, what I would say is we are implementing um, fairness and justice uh, in the interior enforcement um, architecture of the Department of Homeland Security uh, after four years uh, of a regime that would not be characterized uh, by those uh, two terms. And uh, I think that uh, we will see in the coming days uh, further changes with respect to uh, interior enforcement uh, because the guidelines that were issued on January 20th and uh, revised on February 18th are interim guidelines. And uh, I intend to um, uh, place my own uh, mark on them. I think what we, um, what I didn't expect uh, is the, um, the tragic uh, rise of the Delta variant and the setback in the arc uh, of the pandemic. Uh, we can all recall uh, our um, enthusiasm and optimism with respect to where we were headed, and we took a step. We took a step back by reason of that. Uh, I did not expect to be uh, in uh, late September where we are right now, nor did anyone hope to be. Let me let me ask a little bit further about unexpected. You know, it, this really is the first time that during the summer, in historically, that during the summer months we've seen numbers at the southwest border increasing rather than beginning to decrease. What Was it the expectation that, that the numbers would begin to decrease come spring? Um, uh, or have you felt prepared I, for, I think, for those contingencies? It, well, I think we were prepared for, for the contingency, but I think we were hoping that um, the seasonal trends uh, would uh, in fact continue. And I think what what uh, we we I would I would say that we lose sight of sometimes in the discourse is the fact that we are in an unprecedented time of a pandemic, and so uh, it is not regular order from an operational perspective. When we have uh, unaccompanied children uh, arriving in the numbers that we do have. And the Delta variant causes a, a operational change where now, rather than test the children, uh, once they arrive in a health and human services facility, uh, we have to test them on intake and isolate and quarantine them if necessary from the outset. That is a dramatic change in our operations that never before did we have to, well, uh, in my lifetime, uh, uh, as um, uh, you know, 20 years in the government, uh, did we have to, to address that when we place families uh, in processing centers for the purpose of uh, testing, isolating and quarantining them before placing them on an alternative to detention or case management or an NTA. That's a remarkable change uh, in our entire operational architecture. 
And I, and I should say that we are not detaining families. That's an important point. So I'm gonna turn us to, Af to the Afghan flows because that's of course been a major uh, unexpected development, but a major undertaking. Um, what is your vetting showing about this population and uh, who, who have arrived in the United States and the ones that are also uh, in, at, at li lily pad locations? And uh, what are the longer term challenges for DHS uh, uh, with the Afghan admissions and flows? So uh, Doris, I, let me, if I can take a step back because I do have to um, uh, champion uh, the workforce for a, for a moment and I would do it for the entire time uh, if I could. Um, because in the midst of addressing a very significant uh, irregular migration on the Southern border, in the midst of addressing um, uh, really uh, an unprecedented a sweep of uh, natural uh, disasters by reason of uh, climate change. With all of the things we have going on, uh, we were still looked to uh, to lead the federal response uh, and, uh, and lead Operation Allies Welcome. And that's, I think, a testament to what we have proven in terms of our operational uh, capacity. Um, I think there, 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 there's one uh, very significant challenge, and that will be um, the successful enduring resettlement of the Afghan um, uh, population here in the United States. Uh, 64,000 uh, approximately uh, currently uh, here, a percentage of whom uh, of course, are U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents uh, that have a foothold uh, in the country already, um, a percentage of whom have special immigrant visas or, quite frankly, other vulnerable uh, Afghans who might have relationships um, upon which they could draw uh, to ease the resettlement process. But there are thousands and thousands uh, who don't. And I think that is going to be uh, a challenge. It's a challenge that we're incredibly proud um, to be a part of. Is the vetting- oh, on, the, on the vetting, Do uh, Doris, you mentioned the vetting. Right. The vetting, the vetting begins uh, in uh, the third country, the transit uh, countries. Um, we surged um, hundreds of personnel and, and machines there. It's quite a, um, uh, an extraordinary uh, effort. Um, and so we conduct the biometric and biographic screening in the transit countries before individuals uh, board flights. It has been tremendously successful thus far. And if people who have already arrived here uh, do have a vetting problem of one sort or another, you're prepared to deal with that. Yes. And we have a, we have really a, um, a twofold response. And remember, what we, what, we, what we see is information that raises a question, uh, not necessarily a national security question, but uh, uh, can be just an admissibility uh, question. Um, and, it and it takes time to resolve that question. And um, we do have, of course, our secondary uh, um, screening uh, apparatus. Uh, well in place. We've set up, we've expanded that at both Dulles uh, Airport and Philadelphia are two ports of entry uh, that we are, we are using. Um, and we have in fact uh, returned uh, a few people to um, uh, other countries and we have placed a few people in a removal proceedings and it's been a de minimis number. Okay, this is my last question and then we're gonna to go to the audience, but I must ask you a question about USCIS because that's of course the agency that is close to your heart and you have um, a strong experience with it. We're in a situation now where th thousands of green cards are gonna go unused this year. Um, what, are, what are the plans? Uh, and of course that has so much to do with COVID, et cetera, but what, what are the plans for uh, reducing these uh, staggering backlogs? 
And let me also ask you about the three really large new areas of work facing USCIS. The implementation of the asylum rule, the dialing up to 125,000 uh, refugee admissions from, from very, very few, um, and, um, uh, and of course the ongoing Afghan admissions uh, program. What is it going to take to enable USCIS to carry off those responsibilities? So it is a very big lift. We're incredibly saddened to, you know, of course, see the green card um, backlog that uh, you correctly note that COVID uh, has been um, an extraordinary driver of that backlog, uh, but also, uh, uh, frankly, the, the agency for that and other reasons, uh, quite candidly, has found itself in really financial, significant financial straits. And that is not attributed, attributable exclusively uh, uh, to, uh, to COVID. Um, uh, I do think that the uh, approach uh, uh, to immigration writ large of the prior administration, uh, significant closing of the golden door uh, contributed materially uh, to that. You know, um, on the Afghan, uh, the processing of Afghans, it's pretty incredible to see U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services resident in the military facilities uh, taking, you know, uh, doing the processing uh, up front, uh, up, upstream. It's a, it's a real efficiency. USCIS has exceeded uh, its goals and expectations with respect to the green card backlog. Uh, that doesn't, it didn't solve the problem. It just frankly, numerically, uh, quantitatively, uh, could not. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be uh, participating in the refugee consultations uh, with the Secretary of State uh, to present the 125,000 figure. Um, Doris, the, uh, you know the, um, the agency uh, exceedingly well. Um, that agency has not had a fee rule uh, uh, for more than six years. Um, we are uh, working uh, on a fee rule, and um, uh, it is uh, most likely going to be uh, uh, significant, but with, with equally significant accommodations to ensure that no one is disenfranchised financially uh, from the benefits for which they might qualify. We are also seeking appropriated dollars to bridge the gap of time so that USCIS can in fact um, implement effectively uh, the asylum rule and meet uh, the goals uh, of um, the refugee processing. Okay, let's go to the audience. So the first question I have here is from uh, Quinn Owen at ABC News. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you told Chris Wallace on Fox yesterday that, or Sunday, yeah, yesterday, that approximately uh, uh, 10 to 12,000 of those encountered in Del Rio have been released on conditions. Are you concerned that people will view those releases as an incentive to come? Should more be detained by ICE? Um, well, um, uh, the number I think is a, a bit above the 10 to 12,000, just to be, um, uh, uh, clear, um, I, I might have, I think it's about 12, 13, about 13,000. Uh, uh, um, uh, the numbers uh, that are uh, placed in immigration court proceedings um, are a function uh, of um, uh, our operational uh, capacity um, and also uh, what we consider to be uh, appropriate. We are messaging uh, to the diaspora community uh, uh, the fact that they should not take uh, the journey, the perilous journey here um, uh, for the reasons uh, that um, we so compellingly saw over the last uh, few weeks. Let me go to a question about um, prosecutorial discretion. The question is, uh, what is DHS doing to implement its prosecutorial discretion administrative closure policy in good faith. ICE trial attorneys continue to oppose 
requests or offer termination, which is not always in the client's best interest versus administrative closure. Um, so uh, we're um, uh, actually in, um, I spent some time uh, on this uh, yesterday, in fact, uh, taking a look at our uh, uh, admin closure uh, processes and uh, doing an assessment uh, to see, in fact, uh, how we are performing with respect to uh, our commitment. Um, I, I, um, I expect to, um, to include something on this very subject uh, in very short order. I will say um, uh, one thing I'd like to lift up is the uh, OPLA guidance uh, that we issued. And it, uh, um, uh, that is uh, predicated on a principle uh, that uh, was uh, really uh, the North Star uh, of, of mine and of federal prosecutors, prosecutors when I served as an assistant US attorney. And that is that the role of a government attorney uh, is to do justice. I think it harkens back to what the Dean said uh, at the very outset, the law is but a means and justice is the end. Because what, uh, what we communicated in that guidance is if someone, if, a, if, a, if an OPLA lawyer uh, sees an individual on the other side of the courtroom who is unrepresented and that individual very well might have rights that are not being advanced by reason of his or her um, uh, inability or ignorance uh, to advance them, then it is the obligation of the OPLA Council to advance them uh, in the service of justice. And I think that is something that is deserving uh, of um, attention. We're very proud of it. So let me go now to a question about parole. Uh, the question is, uh, DHS has wide discretion to use its parole power to advance its stated humanitarian goals, including with Afghan nationals and along the border. What is DHS doing to revise its use of parole to meet these new goals that is different from the previous administration? And how will it plan to inform the public of these revised guidelines? So um, uh, I don't know exactly um, how, you know, uh, what all the changes um, are that have been implemented. Uh, I have not uh, heard of complaints with respect to an unduly restrictive approach to the standards pursuant to which parole uh, is granted. I'll have to take a look at that because uh, certainly uh, there's been um, no shortage of complaints, uh, but I haven't heard um, a complaint about our application of humanitarian parole. If there's a concern, I'd like to know about it. Um, okay, so the next question is, um, uh, will, will we see an elimination of the permanent bar as part of any immigration reform efforts? Many of these individuals re-entered the U.S. to be reunited from their with their families. Additionally, can we expect a change where parents of U.S. citizen adult children can be considered as qualifying relatives for waivers of unlawful presence? Now, I read that question because that's a question that is squarely uh, one that only Congress can resolve, I believe. And um, we are, of course, in the midst of a big debate around reconciliation. And if one takes at face value the parliamentarians ruling that it's unlikely that immigration will be in reconciliation, um, uh, then the question becomes legislation per se. So maybe you could talk a bit about that legislative landscape and what it is that you might be hearing or doing uh, slightly more behind the scenes from what's in the newspapers. Uh, well, Doris, if I was doing things behind the scenes and spoke of them, they wouldn't be behind the well, scenes. Well, pardon too me, long, that's would true. That is no, a no, uh, contradiction uh, but, in terms, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but um, indeed, I think um, you know the permanent bar and the, and um, uh, the point about qualifying relatives uh, would indeed require legislative uh, action. And um, I don't think that um, uh, 
there is a um, necessarily a finality uh, to the parliamentarians' um, uh, perspective. That certainly was uh, the parliamentarians' ruling with respect to that which was uh, presented squarely to her. Um, I think that process is an ongoing one. And I think the drive to uh, for legislation is unrelenting and correctly so. Uh, I just, it is so imperative. I mean, we, we uh, Doris and I uh, met in, um, uh, for the first time in uh, 2009. Um, and we haven't stopped talking about the need for immigration reform. And that conversation, while we might not have had it with one another before then, we certainly had it respectively uh, with uh, uh, our colleagues uh, well, well before then. It is uh, just stunning um, how there is unanimity with respect to the broken condition of our immigration system and a failure to fix it. Yes, that is certainly the case. And, you know, uh, so much is lost in the process of, uh, I mean, lost in understanding that so much of what takes place and what the executive branch does and has to do are workarounds to the fact that the basic structure of the immigration laws, which squarely fall in Congress's purview, um, uh, that's really what's been missing in action. So I, um, uh, it, it is worthwhile to not forget that. Um, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to give you a short final question uh, that's come up on the screen here. It is, Secretary Mayorkas, can you explain why the northern land border is not open? Why is there no vaccine or testing requirement? At, well, let's just, can you explain why the northern land border is not open? Well, um... The northern land border, uh, when you when one is speaking, of, I think the question goes specifically uh, to the ports of entry. Right, um, and, and why yes. there isn't testing requirements there. Right, and um, uh, there is, um, they, they are open uh, for essential uh, uh, travel, not open for non-essential uh, travel, and that too is a product um, uh, of uh, the pandemic. And uh, there are operational uh, constraints in that environment. And I think the decision, and, and quite frankly, that has been the subject of ongoing dialogue and review as well, not just um, the ports of entry and the Title 19 uh, authority uh, that rests in the Department of Homeland Security, but quite frankly, international travel uh, through the ports of entry, non-essential air travel, for example, and the 212F authority that rests with the president. And of course, the president made a recent announcement in that regard. And I think we're taking a look at um, all aspects uh, of travel in the context of uh, the pandemic um, and making our decisions accordingly. Okay, well, we are at the end of our time, and I hope that those who are in the audience uh, uh, have, uh, by the range of questions that have come up and that we've tried to talk about, gotten a sense of how broadly your areas of responsibility span and the many, many things that are on your plate. But to you in particular, thank you so much for being open to this more informal exchange. Very best wishes with the important work that you're doing. And we will now close out this keynote session. Um, thanks to those who submitted questions. Uh, let me remind those who are in our audience that um, we're apologetic for not being able to get all, to all of the questions. But do please return to the platform and click on the link to join our three o'clock session. Uh, and that first panel, uh, which is our um, state of play panel called Scrambled by Policy Shifts and COVID-19, the state of play for immigration. Thank you for Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Have a very good day. Thank you, Doris. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir.